give it a few more minutes uh, to allow everyone to join, then we can start. Give me the powers to share. Okay. Uh, So it's working. Yeah, it's working. Uh, I could see it well. Uh, once again, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's five minutes past seven. We will commence now. I hope you and your loved ones are keeping well. Welcome to today's session. Um, as you already know, KMA SACO runs periodic uh, webinars uh, aims, aimed at addressing members' needs. And today is a series of these webinars where we're discussing investments. And uh, no better time than now to have this topic considering the economic devastation that COVID-19 has, has, has done in many countries, as well as in personal finances. Uh, that uh, coupled with recent reports of uh, investments where people have lost money that have been in the press, and all this um, points to need for us to uh, have really solid in, uh, investment knowledge and be able to make uh, these kind of uh, decisions comfortably. Our program today runs about one hour, one hour and a half. We'll have a session of a guest presenter, followed by Q&A session. And then after that, uh, we will have um, uh, final remarks uh, from the SACO. So to kick us off, I would like to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Mr. Patrick Wameo. Uh, Mr. Wameo is an executive director and lead consultant at uh, Financial Academy. He has a 15 years of experience in investment banking and is an associate of the Chartered Institute of Bankers. He has spent over 13 years in financial literacy coaching for individuals and directs a program called World Intelligence. So perhaps at the end of this uh, session, we'll look investors. So uh, before I hand over to Mr. Patrick, just a, a few on housekeeping that please, uh, whenever you have questions in the course of the presentation or even during the Q&A, please post them at the Q&A session. Yeah, right down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A, that is um, where you, you should be responded to. Um, we'll try as much as possible to answer all the questions. Uh, with that, I will hand over to you, Mr. Patrick. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Just a minute, I am sharing. <clears throat> I'm trying to share my slides so that all of us can be on the same wavelength. 
Voice is still clear. Yes. Good evening. <coughs> Good evening. And if you could also put it on full screen, uh, presentation mode. Yes. OK, great. Great. So we will be discussing an aspect of personal finance management. Uh, really the fourth or the fifth step uh, in the work to personal finance management, building a portfolio that takes care of um, uh, your risks in both moment and space of time. So this, the topic today is a portfolio, <coughs> investment portfolio diversification. But before you diversify, you must create it. And before you create it, there are some preliminary steps. So in the background section of this training, which will occupy about eight minutes, I want to discuss the preliminaries because uh, as they say, you cannot plant a tree from the middle, you start from somewhere. So that all of us can be in the same picture. Uh, the first things first, have been introduced and that speaks all of it. <clears throat> that was the last phase I wore as a banker, as an investment banker, uh, 2009, and the rest is stories. So in the background, there's a, a diagram there or a picture, whichever way it speaks to you, that doesn't speak of a very good looking financial situation. Uh, this is not the kind of fellow who will have a portfolio. And if he does have one, then he's an, an accident of, of meeting assets, a meeting of assets, not just a portfolio. So we need to move away from this financial kind of mess to a much better uh, picture, which I'll show you at the end. And to do so, the first thing is the person who handles money. I will not spend time in explaining this, but I need everyone in this sitting to understand that uh, you cannot make good choices when you don't understand why you do things the way you do them. So there are two ways of managing assets. One is called active, which means you are actively involved with the assets, or otherwise the alternative is passive which means you hire a service to manage your assets. And for that to happen, there has to be a code of relationship, normally called an investment policy statement. So what that does is that it limits loss um, different from when you are doing things yourself. So when you're doing things yourself, then an understanding of self is important. and. What I mean by an understanding of self is really an understanding of the drivers of your choices. One of them being your value system. Your value system has a key role in the kind of choices you make, both in terms of time and space and quantum. How you approach risk is that are embedded. So as much as I will not discuss that in this class or this session, it is important that you appreciate that a portfolio that we will be discussing today is either being managed by a person who is under own influence and external influence or being managed by a person on behalf of somebody else, particularly the one that is being managed by self. So knowing yourself, knowing why you do things the way you do them, knowing why you make choices with money when you make them, is important for currently, for example, uh, Corona, uh, the COVID-19 situation across the country and across the continent and the world indeed has caused asset values to decline significantly. And therefore you'd be speaking the language of the wealthy. Uh, you'd be saying that the market is awash with uh, quality and valued assets. But for some people, this is when to run away from buying because they don't understand themselves. Even when you give them information, the risk of the fear of loss 
uh, which presents a risk to them, will hold them away from participating when others are busy transferring wealth, uh, mainly from the poor to the wealthy. So an understanding of your emotions on your choices and the state of self-control or self-management, as I prefer to call it, is key as part of uh, this successful story. When you are balancing your portfolio, you need to sell some and buy some. And sometimes people are informed by fear, not fact. And that may lead to a portfolio dilution that is not worth an inch of the shilling. Um, the goal of financial literacy to you is important because a portfolio delivers a portfolio delivers in returns, and those returns are the things that uh, drive us to make investments. So knowing money, knowing how to make responsible choices is a key element of building a portfolio and indeed uh, undertaking a portfolio diversification. So in the background section, allow me to say that uh, portfolio diversification does not mean no risk, it simply means carrying risks in a manner that you don't lose, lose. So if one side of your portfolio is going down subject to some factors, the other side is safe. That is what I'll be discussing in layman language. And of course, finally, there are elements of personal finance that you ought to have been good at even before you arrive at your portfolio. Number one is having very clear goals because portfolios are built to achieve specific return goals. So financial goals are a necessary element <clears throat> of guiding the quality of a portfolio. You cannot say your portfolio is okay when there are no goals that are confirming whether or not it is meeting them. The art of budgeting your money is equally very important because building a portfolio requires you to consistently put money in some asset classes as per the, your, per the investment policy statement. Of course, the act of investing or the act of executing the plan. So the plan that comes from those goals has to be executed and the purchase and sale of assets are investment plan execution actions. And that's why I say it's not right to discuss a portfolio unless you have a plan that you're pursuing. Otherwise, what you have is a meeting of assets that do not have any relationship. Uh, where is the place of borrowing in building a portfolio? I'll not discuss this today, but I must remind us that borrowing makes you have the money when you don't have it to be able to take an investment action. So the place of borrowing in a circle in particular because I'm talking to SACO members, is about where is your loan request and your investment portfolio meeting. I have seen through my work, in the course of my work in this sector, I had a chance to assess, to look at a loan books of 244 circles over a five-year period. And you could find as many as five different loans taken by one individual, all of them towards acquiring a particular asset. So uh, it, the, the loan product becomes irrelevant in a circle. It is the end game that matters. So borrowing in this respect is key. We borrow on short term, long term and medium term loans to, to actually acquire some assets, both for our personal use and for investment purposes. For example, a KMA has a mortgage product. So where is the place of, of a mortgage product in your investment portfolio um, in building up your investment portfolio? Uh, those are the kind of questions you should be asking along the way. So savings is a key element of creating money. You, your savings levels determine your credit worthiness um, in the eyes of the lenders. So how are you playing with savings towards a portfolio um, uh, 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 of assets? In, in any case, liquid cash is always part of a portfolio. Anything between 10% and 30%
depending on the age of the holder of the portfolio. You'll always have some cash in liquid form or in treasury bills or near cash. Some we say something is liquid when you can sell it quickly without significant loss in value. Then uh, spending, judicial spending in particular, which makes more cash to be available. So all these items are related in one way or the other. Um, when you spend judiciously, then you have more money uh, to invest. People who have been spending judiciously over the years have had more savings. They are having a good time buying assets from people who are selling them. I was recently offered a property worth 2.5 million for only 850K. Unfortunately, I was cash, cash broke, so I've not bought it. And, and you can imagine what savings then does. So when you do all these things, then you are working towards your retirement planning, which the portfolio is generating income towards, so that you will have the money when you need it for the purposes for which you need it. So in the background section, I'm done. Just to remind you that before you set goals, you always go through the path of determining your current situation, uh, which shows you how things are standing as is. Then you use that information uh, to develop goals and a plan. And then the execution of this plan involves acquiring assets. And as you hold the assets, you reduce some holding as the environment changes and raise others as the environment changes, what we call portfolio rebalancing. Those are items of portfolio management that are only done to an existing portfolio. So you've got to develop financial goals and turn those goals into a plan. In layman language, a financial plan is really a set of goals that have a relationship. Uh, Short-term goals to create savings, for example, and then you borrow against those savings in a circle. And then you use that saving, that, that loan to acquire an asset. Just this morning, I was speaking to a gentleman I spoke to last in 2014. And I, I was demonstrating to him what the SGR will do when it, when it comes. That was 2014. So today he called me in the morning for a one hour recap and we were discussing. So how has the railway changed the scenario? And he couldn't believe that I'm asking for 10% of the time. So what is the place of those useful information in your portfolio? Sorry, sorry, sorry. For real. Dr. Bondo, please, uh, if you could mute. Thank you. I don't know why my, my knee is hanging, but I'm having a hanging, hanging screen. Just a minute. My screen is hanging. So that's good. So once you have done a plan, then there is an evaluation of your risks. And I must say that risks are age-based, largely. As you grow older, your risks change. So the risk, the risk structure that you faced when you started will be very different from the risk structure that you carry as you go along. And I'll be using a timeline to show that as we discuss the place of risks in a portfolio. Key financial risk is liquidity or, in fact, illiquidity. The other one is actual loss of an asset. I'm sure a number of you um, may have been affected by holdings in Kenya Airways. If you're holding Kenya Airways, you know what I mean. At one point, it was a very healthy share, costing 146 shillings. I don't think it has gone beyond 16 in the last five years. So for someone who has held that share in both periods, uh, you have personal experiences with it. So ability to take on investment risks is key. Um, to maintain certain assets, in your portfolio and even to put them in. So part of that ability is being able to actually lose an investment or lose part of an investment and move on as if nothing happened. <clears throat> Most of us face this challenge because we don't have such a huge portfolio as to stay alive when we lose part of it. 
So losing 100,000 bob worth of assets could be quite a damage to somebody, while for the other is 10 million, for the other is 100 million, <clears throat> and much for others, you're discussing billions of dollars and they are still able to work. So your ability to take risk is a key element in portfolio construction and subsequent rebalancing of the portfolio. So bottom rock is that the moment you have an investment plan, whether it is written or not, you have an investment policy statement. Basically, what am I saying? An investment policy statement outlines the kind of assets you can be involved with, both in terms of their returns and risk factors, where the risk factor must be right for your expected returns. Number two, uh, how long you can hold that asset, given the fact that you're growing older every day. So from an individual point of view, uh, you may, for example, find it very interesting to buy land when you're young. Uh, basically for what we normally call hoping that the value will, will rise. But then now when, when you are 35, that is interesting. When you hit 50, 51, and your children are now in campus, <coughs> we are asking whether the land is still useful to you because the land now needs to earn for you cash. At that age, you now need a cash earning asset. So if you still need to hold land that you bought 50 years ago, then the environment in which it exists must have changed substantially so that that land now can earn you cash. Otherwise, you turn that land into cash and buy land elsewhere that can now be, be used for a project that is cash earning. So any, any one asset in our portfolio becomes irrelevant as time changes, or in fact becomes very relevant as time changes, if it was in fact wrong. So as, as, as a younger person, your ability to take risk is lower. You buy assets that tend to be less volatile and will give you returns in, long run, in the longer run. Whereas as you grow older, you buy assets that are more liquid, can be sold easily, and also produce for you cash. I will be giving you a specific example, and then we are able to relate to it. Um, in terms of the issues that you have to watch, uh, that the strategic investment plan guide you on, is your current age and family circumstances. A 35-year-old man with a younger wife and perhaps one child below the age of five has very low risk in terms of, say, liquidity. His current income can almost meet most of his needs and that current income can just be a salary but as you grow older the same person growing older 15 years later with three children in the ages between say 15 and 21 the, the family circumstances change substantially particularly if your attitude was such that you preferred to take children to certain schools during their primary and secondary education, it also opens you up to, to require them to go to specific universities, probably abroad, and the fees that you are expected to pay is not low anymore. In my, <clears throat> in my consulting career, I have met a lady doctor who was taking home 1.6 million a month, but was broke every month basically because of the choices the family had made previously now running into current circumstances but when we walked around those numbers we were able to bring back 618,000 bob that was otherwise not being used properly so there, there are moments when choices in in the family circumstances are really the reason why you can't hold a portfolio you are having to sell assets because you need cash and you are needing cash to meet choices <clears throat> which you did start but cannot be sustained by your present income unless some assets are sold to subsidize. So your current financial position, what we call the net worth, the relationship between the assets which you own 
and the liabilities which finance them. Liabilities are the loans and similar instruments that you've borrowed. So what you've borrowed to acquire the assets versus the assets, uh, when you relate them, how much do you have remaining? I personally found myself at 35 years worth 40 million shillings worth of assets and carried by 38 million worth of loans. So really my net worth was 2 million. And that was the trigger for me to stop sitting in the office where I was sitting with that nice tie to be where I am tireless because I needed to change some things. So current financial position will determine whether or not you can carry the current portfolio uh, in, this, in, in the manner and structure in which it is. Disposable income available, both active, that active income is active, the income you earn from working with your mind and body. For a doctor, this could be a salary and this could be consultant fees. A passive income is the income you're earning from your existing investments uh, that don't require you to be involved. Usually this is a business that pays money whether you are there or not, or real estate property that pays money whether you are there or not. Then portfolio income is the income you earn from a portfolio of assets, usually financial assets. I will be discussing those portfolio assets later here. <clears throat> um, uh, so your portfolio uh, made of both passive and portfolio, uh, where your investment made of both passive assets and portfolio assets and your active income together become what you call the income. Now, the income minus mandatory expenses give you the disposable income, which you can use at will. The size of that disposable income determine your ability to invest or take part in investment or otherwise not to take part. Then, of course, the liquidity needs. The levels of safety, current levels of safety, determined by your, the depth of your emergency savings. And of course, the monies you have available on short notice to meet unexpected demands on your of cash flow demands on you determine how much money you must keep liquid in your portfolio. So I'll just be discussing um, the, the place of liquidity in a portfolio, but just showing you an example. Then return needs. Uh, return needs, um, if you are investing for a kid who is say six years old in grade one, and you intend to use the investment return to pay their college uh, fees from age 17 um, forward, then the amount of money that you are investing per month and the returns that you must earn on that investment cumulatively and individually becomes a determinant as to whether or not your investment will produce the amount of money you need to pay the fees when this kid is 16, 17, uh, from age 6, 11 years later. So if the return levels do not meet what I would call your expected minimum return, then you will miss the goal, which might mean that at the time when you ought to pay school fees, for London School of Economics, you may end up paying university fees for USIU in Nairobi. So it's still a goal achieved university education that you had a plan to take your kids to London School of Economics, except that you've not made your return. That is when you also call us for a fundraising for school fees, just to confirm that something did not get up to target. Uh, finally, your ability to take risk, which I have explained, this is determined by the depth of your portfolio and portfolio return, and therefore your ability to lose either an investment or a portion of the investment or lose the income and still be able to move on as if nothing happened. Of course, finally, a portfolio is also determined by your peculiar preferences. I am raised as an Opus Dei Catholic. And for example, we would not be able to accept investments in alcohol based kind of assets. A Muslim might not be very comfortable investing in uh, a pork based kind of asset. So those are peculiar preferences. 
even if those assets have got very good returns, your participation is zero. So I need you to understand that in diversifying your assets in a portfolio, which is what we've congregated discuss, there are a number of contributing factors that you cannot ignore. So what then is a portfolio? A portfolio, you'd call it as the whole holding that you've put in money. And a portfolio really is an output of an investment plan. An investment plan is really an output of a life plan on which you put your budget money. So if today Patrick Romeo desires to retire at the age of 60 with income not less than 450,000 bob from a certain investment in, in assets, then the portfolio that I hold must bring such cash return that is not less than 450,000. So in arriving at that portfolio, we will be looking at assets that will be paying cash every month or which can be sold into cash and produce the 450,000 which you need monthly. So your portfolio must carry such assets that either will produce cash or can be sold to produce cash without significant loss in the value of the asset. Such an asset is called a liquid asset. So if you take the example of a pension fund, a pension fund will hold assets in buildings, a pension fund will hold assets in real estate, uh, different classes of real estate, industrial real estate, hospitals, um, or hospitality, which include hospitals and hotels, uh, residential, which are purely used for night space, like guest houses, or homes, the kind which we pay rent on, or indeed any other form of asset that can earn money. They would also hold uh, assets such as shares in specific companies that re reflect the risk appetite of the fund. A fund could be aggressive or a fund could be docile. A, young, a fund made up of young people is generally very aggressive, will invest, will invest in assets that will pay more money in future, while a fund that has got more older people will invest more in assets that are cash earning. So if you look at a fund uh, that has a large number of people who are retiring soon, then the kind of assets that they'll be holding will be very sensitive to the cash flow because these people who are retiring soon need cash out, both in terms of lump sum and in terms of monthly, monthly pension. <clears throat> Same to you. If you are now an individual, you will hold assets according to your age profile. A 35-year-old, 45-year-old kind of person, that range would tend to hold assets that will pay you in future. So for real estate, they will hold real estate that promise growth. The older people will hold real estate, but which, which promise monthly cash flow. So the, both of them are holding one asset called real estate, but someone is holding real estate that promise growth in the future. This is the kind of person who can go and buy land in the Great Eastern Bypass or the Great Southern Bypass that are yet to be built, but I can assure you will not be built 15 years from now. But by that time when they are moved from 35, they are now nearing 50, then there will be an, an environment that now necessitates those bypasses to be built. So their assets around those bypasses will then become very liquid. But currently, no. So an older person like now me at 50 would be holding on assets that are earning me rent more and more and less and less of assets that promise growth. So that my portfolio will have real estate but the kind of real estate I will hold will be determined by my cash need or liquidity need of that asset. So a portfolio for, for me would be like 60% uh, assets that are more liquid or are that promise growth and liquidity. And almost the remaining 40% will be between capital market assets 
that can be sold fast and cash holding or, or, or in instruments that are very near cash at almost 10 20 percent so between the 40 percent will be almost 50 50 cash and near cash 20 and um, the kind of shares that are liquid that can be sold easily are the breweries of this world the BATs of this world the safaricoms of this world that can be sold very easily for cash because in my age when i am sick i need a lot of money but for a younger person when he's sick the company offers him a medical that can take care of his situation <clears throat> so our our age circumstances determine whether or not we hold similar assets with similar risks or similar assets with varying levels of risks so that's a very key element of your portfolio so a portfolio will vary with the age of the person so i want to show you an, an a graphic example here so a person a young doctor in block number four and a fairly old doctor and i know many such doctors in the ages nine and ten um will hold real estate for example but you'll find the doctor in nine and ten holding real estate that is rent earning actively rent earning real estate number one that doctor can afford a huge asset so he's likely to be buying an asset of high quality in the right environment he can buy apartments he can buy he can buy a whole block of flats he can be owning a whole block of flats in a rent intensive area um, anywhere in nairobi he can own a home in karen or runda comfortably uh, so those kind of assets whether he's using them or not using them will be actively earning rent yet a doctor in number four a young doctor in number four and number five will tend to acquire real estate in the form of plots that promise future a capital growth they are people seeking konza they are people who want to hold multiple plots in aggressive zones so we have property in both portfolios but one is buying a portfolio that is aggressive that promises capital growth while the other now must turn those plots that they bought in the past into rental earning blocks of apartments or flats so that whereas the property portfolio will be 60 percent in both portfolios one is a rent earning portfolio and the other is capital growth creating uh, assets so that that's that that is what that is how different it is now think about shares someone in age between 22 and 35 will have shares in their portfolio approximately 30 20 percent 30 percent um a bit before you turn the age of 35 or even even up to 49 your share holding can be quite a bit but the type of shares that these people will hold are shares that promise growth companies that are well managed that have got expansionary um, activities as opposed to companies like BAT and breweries that have lost opportunities for expansion they are now maximizing their local market they are called mature companies so an older person in the ages of seven and eight will tend to hold shares but a mix of both uh, growth shares and shares that are earning rent but the moment you enter number nine and number ten you are holding of shares one shrink significantly to less than 20 percent of the portfolio and even the shares you hold must either produce dividends or must be very marketable the kind of shares that you see at the nsc showing that they were sold today and yesterday in large numbers not the ones that are sold once in a green moon so shares put in your portfolio will tend to be rent i mean to be earning new income and less and less of capital growth so you get dividends at the end of the period and if you need to sell them the buyers are available now the moment you hit 70 and above then you are really either earning rent or you have cash assets assets that are in cash form largely 
So you need a huge component, almost 40% of your money to be in liquid or near liquid assets that can be turned into cash quickly and where you hold assets like, like property, then those, there must be rent and in, and in very good locations where rent is not in jeopardy, even when the economy is doing badly. <clears throat> there are property in Nairobi that will always earn their owner's rent with full occupancy. Incidentally, they are in the East. They are not in the West. People in the East pay rent. People in the West can struggle to pay rent, yet they have got very good incomes. So an understanding of that risk factor is very key in the portfolio you hold. So when you talk about portfolio diversification, we are talking about apportioning your portfolio to different asset classes in a manner that when one asset class is suffering from a change in an economic factor, the other asset classes are not equally affected. I'll discuss one or two factors for purposes of driving this home. One of the factors that affect asset value is inflation. Uh, inflation is a direct output of the interest rate levels. So when the interest levels, interest rate levels in an economy are generally rising, that has a direct impact on the purchasing power of the money in that market. And therefore the inflationary behaviors in that market. So you will notice, for example, there are months in Kenya when, when prices of goods and services are generally very high. Uh, for example, during drought period. Uh, that period requires CBK to manage very carefully the balance between inflows and outflows of our currency against major currencies because if that is if that if the inflows or the outflows of our currency against other, other other major currencies is in favor of those other currencies then our shilling will become weaker meaning that we need more shilling to buy a dollar and if if, if we are looking at goods that are coming from outside our our imports and we are paying more of our shilling to buy that it simply means that when we now use that good to produce something here the price of the output will be higher so the inflationary behaviors in the market which has got to do with the the balance between the supply of our currency to foreign currency and of course the general price levels the purchasing power of the shilling uh, determine the value of an asset and over time an asset will face rising inflation or have inflation in the opposite direction so assets in the market the value of the assets in the market will keep changing as the market responds to the levels of inflation i think in the last seven eight years the central bank has managed the inflation levels very tightly perhaps the the tightest i've seen since the year 1999 or let's get better since the year 1992 when we had some very crazy inflation rates here so when you take a factor like inflation it is either rising if inflation is rising it affects some specific counters companies whose activities are affected by rising inflation the value of their shares go down yeah. there are there are there are companies like medicine making companies or food manufacturing companies who do not quite experience inflation rises inflation because people will eat food under all circumstances and people will buy medicine under all circumstances unfortunately in kenya we don't have many such companies in the nsc but if you're in an economy where that is the case then you'll find what you call inflation neutral companies they are largely medicine and food companies and food producing what we need like the food we need like unga what we need uh, all the time I'm, I'm avoiding the use of some words uh, there, there are foods which may be in the market 
but they are preserved for some people. But if you discuss Wunga, Wunga is needed in the, the family with the highest income and is also needed in the family with the lowest income and is needed more in the middle. So you find such a company being inflation neutral. So there are assets that are inflation neutral, there are assets that are inflation negative, and there are assets that are inflation positive. So when inflation is rising, the value of the asset is declining when it's inflation negative. And when it's inflation positive, when inflation is rising, the value of the asset is rising. So when you, have, when you are constructing a portfolio, your portfolio needs to take into account the opposite movements. So when one asset is moving against the same factor of inflation, the other one is moving downwards against it so that you end up with a mid, a mid, an average so that if you are losing, if you are gaining value on this asset and you are losing value on this asset, then what you end up is with the average of the gain and the loss so that you really don't lose. So when, 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 when portfolios are being constructed, that is taken into account. And that is not something you must know as a doctor in detail. You just need to be aware if someone is actively managing your portfolio, that they are doing that for you. Now, when you are, when you are managing your portfolio yourself, then you must come to the knowledge of those factors. Because otherwise you risk facing a drop in your portfolio. So asset diversification, in different asset classes in such quantities that the entire portfolio leave you better off in terms of returns, rate of returns absolute, and cash flow absolute. In a very layman language, I can't say it better unless now I begin to speak our language. Just the way you write things we can't read, we also speak things you can't understand occasionally. So that, that is exactly what it means that you need to carry a mix of asset classes, some that give you stability, for example, bonds. If you buy a bond, bonds tend to uh, move less up and move up and down less. Uh, the volatility of the value of the bond is there, but it doesn't move like a share. So if you hold a portfolio, then that portfolio should have some bonds in the liquid portion of it. The bonds give you a good return when the government rates are good and also give you stability. So when the rates are moving, bond rates don't move very fast. Now the rate of returns on shares can move very fast. As fast as between a day, it can move extremely up and extremely low. So you are holding in shares is really to give you the upside. The upside is the rise in return and the bonds to secure you from drops in the downsides. So when, when, when a share value is dropping very fast, then bonds, because their values are not moving a lot, they, they, the bond portion of your portfolio maintain the portfolio return stable. I'll explain that again. You have a portfolio with real estate, a portfolio with shares, and a portfolio with bonds and even money market funds. So bonds, because their values don't move very fast, will continue to give you a consistent rate of return. So if bonds are 40% of your portfolio and is giving you 9%, uh, property is giving you 12% and is 60% of your portfolio, then you multiply 60 by 12 to give you what, the, what property is contributing to the whole. Bonds at 40% of the portfolio and giving you 9%, you multiply 40 by 9 to give you the rate that the bonds are contributing to the whole. And then say money market and other assets are carrying the remaining say 10 or 9% 9 of the portfolio and are giving you say 13% then you multiply that 10 by 13%. So the 13% is bringing a very, the rate of 13% is bringing a very small portion of the rate of the entire portfolio because the holding is only 10%. So in that case then, it is a movement in property that will have the biggest impact on your portfolio. 
So when you are an older person and you are holding assets that are 60% real estate and that real estate is really rent earning, then your, your portfolio rate of return will be low, but the liquidity will be very high. But when you are a younger person and you are holding 60% of real, real estate and the real estate is the type that gives you growth, not rent, the growth will be like 40%. So the return on your portfolio will be very high, but the portfolio is very illiquid. You don't have a lot of cash because most of the money is in real estate that is growing very fast. That is really what portfolio diversification is about. Now let's give it context. The last 16 months, we've been having Corona with us. Corona affected business. So people who are employed by those business lost their jobs. And the businesses lost their market segments. So when people lose their jobs, they are forced to sell their assets to remain alive. And the businesses that lose their markets, largely because of the loss of market share, there's a reduction in what you call the value of the assets of that business. So that asset is at a discount in the market. It can now be bought cheaper than it was. So if you look at any company today that was perhaps doing very well before Corona, the share price may have moved from 500,000 to 400,000. I've not checked the brewery's shares in the last one week, but if you look at the, the prices of breweries before Corona and the prices of breweries during Corona, there is almost a 30% discount. If you look at the price, except for Safaricom, that has benefited from, <clears throat> from the technology um, that is being used to, 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 to make payments as opposed to cash movements, the only company whose share price has been rising generally during Corona and a few others that are inflation are neutral. You realize that if you are holding a Safaricom share, then the value of your share has gone up. But if you, are want, if you wanted to buy Safaricom today, then Safaricom is more expensive to buy. Yet all the other shares are being sold as a discount, not because their businesses are dead, but because their businesses depend on a normal business environment when the effects that have been imposed by Corona to the movement of goods and services, to the demand for their services changes. For example, hotels, their services will suffer for the longest time because people are involved and therefore social distancing has become a necessary part of their life. The number of people sitting in a hotel are very few, are much fewer than was the case. Their returns are much lower and therefore their prospects are much poorer and the assets that they are have lower value. They are now being sold as a discount. A hotel as good as Serena is now being sold at a discount of what it would have been under normal circumstances. But when the economy turns around, if, when should Corona effects stabilize faster and then what you call the normal levels of demand go back to their normal levels, then the business that Serena will do will be quite different. The business that breweries will do will be quite a different level because now you can drink your alcohol in house, so ever you want, without restriction of drinking it in very few hours, and the affording power is low. So the sales of breweries will go up. The sales going up means more profit, which means more potential. So in moments like this, identifying what we call assets being sold at a discount is the primary differentiator in portfolio building. And there is no single asset that suits everyone. So you need to speak to your broker to help you identify assets that suit your plan. So if you don't have a plan, then start with a plan. So that then you start to build assets in this moment. You buy assets that are being sold at a discount and immediately the market moves. When, when, when the market recorrects re re itself as the corona effects are get to disappear then you will be winning by just 
the growth in value to the, to the, the, the recorrection even before you pick any value from enhancements. I think that is what I could reasonably say up to where I am. Um, I want to spend a few minutes looking at a financial, a personal financial statement, look at the different types of incomes we get from the different elements of our portfolio with the intention of educating everyone as to whether this thing about portfolio makes sense from basics. And when I'm done with that, then we can go straight into a question and answer session. It is 7.58 and I know I have spent quite some time. So allow me first of all to uh, open that Excel. I'll only focus on the portfolio aspects because I can't do it better. I've done a statement already, so I will not be creating it from now. I have assumed a middle age perhaps picking 200 a month only um, uh, from earned income, where earned income is salary or consulting. I've also assumed that that doctor has some income from business consistently receiving 35,000 a month. Ignore dollars, think shillings. And I've Sorry. also Yes. Sorry, Mr. Patrick, are you already sharing uh, the exhaust sheet? Yes, I'm just starting to share it. Yeah. You, you, but I have not shared it publicly. Okay. okay. That is that's the question you're asking. Okay, great. I'm sharing it. This Excel had been shared with you earlier, so you can use it at your own time. It is for free. Use it and show someone else to use it, how to use it. So assume that I am doctor, not very young, middle-aged, uh, picking approximately 200K in salary and perhaps making a lot of other money uh, through consulting. So that and income number two is the kind of income you may be making, say by locum or that kind of language you use quite often that I don't understand. So assume just 350K income. I know I have met doctors that do 1.5 million. I'm just being modest so that we don't scare the younger ones. Um, this doctor has some real estate investment down there. So I want to assume that he's perhaps picking 50,000 shillings in rent a month and uh, no business income, for example. Uh, so the passive income for him is 50,000 from rent. And because he has some uh, 1 million seeding shares in um, KMA Sako, he's received last time 7,000 a month equivalent of, um, of interest and around 1,000 shillings a month equivalent of dividends from the minimum, the shares you should hold over 100K. So that by just being a member of KMA, he's earning 8,600 a month from interest and dividends. Uh, so that this good doctor has an income of 408,000 shillings from both active income of 350, passive income of 50, and portfolio income of 8,600. Now, from the income point of view, this doctor is in the younger ages or the middle ages so still seems to make more money from, from his, his energy, the use of hours. But what should this doctor be doing? He should be replacing himself by investing more of that money in real estate and business and the portfolio type of assets so that he can earn more in future. So let's go, before we look at expenses, let's go uh, to the place where these monies are made. These monies are made in cash type of savings, which include the shares you have in the circle. So any deposit in a bank, any, any savings you have in a circle, what you call non-withdrawable, those monies pay you interest. I call them bank accounts. Any monies that in, is in treasury bill, any monies that is in treasury bonds, any monies that is in uh, uh, unit trusts or unit trust linked policies, 
they are very similar in nature. They are cash, they are liquid. Then I've also assumed that this good young doctor has just bought a property of 3.5 million, perhaps a flat in one of the budding towns, Kitengela, Rongai, Juja, just to earn some rent from a two bedroom flat or so. So that the investment currently is still in real estate is still very low. But you will notice he has borrowed 700,000 to buy a car. Uh, the car is here and he's borrowed 3.5 million to buy that asset for rent. But he has also borrowed 7 million to buy for himself a home. So this doctor is very heavy on personal use assets. 7.95 million is on assets for his own enjoyment. Yet only 4.3 million shillings is on assets that work for him, what we call portfolio assets. So just to know whether you are making good financial choices, be aware that regardless of the fact that you borrowed, what matters is where the money ends. If this doctor had that 10, 7 million this side, uh, we we're talking about 10.5 million shillings as the investment in real estate. And he would perhaps be renting a home and not uh, owning his own home. The 10 point, not one, sorry, the 10.5 million shillings would perhaps be earning him. If he bought three such small apartments, he would be earning, instead of 50,000, he would be earning, say, uh, 150,000 here. So that investment would perhaps be earning him 150,000 in small, three small apartments. That is a doctor that is financially literate, if he's still young. But as that doctor grows older, uh, one, the dividends will be growing up. The interest will be growing up by the amount of additional savings you make in the circle. The dividends will be stuck because it, unless you are increasing your shares, the dividends will remain largely flat. So the passive income area will only be improved by you investing in capital markets. That is when you can change this number here. So if he makes any investments in the portfolio elements here, in this area of stocks here, assume he puts 2 million bob in stocks, um, 2 million bob, uh, in good shares like BAT uh, that are new dividends, then you'd be expecting that the income in dividends, a typical BAT share gives you 35, 35 shillings and a typical share is worth 500. <clears throat> so if you invest in two, if you invest two million bob in say BAT only, so two million bob in BAT uh, divided by 500 bob per share would give you about 4,000 shares times 35 bob would give you approximately 140,000 140, shillings uh, from BAT only, divide by 12, that comes to 12,000 per month. So his income will grow to 13,600 per month from, 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 uh, from holding a portfolio of shares in BAT only. Now, that is how we try to create a balanced portfolio that gives you some income from portfolio, some income from real estate, and some income from cash assets like uh, what we call interest and dividends that are cash. So cash, uh, cash assets just pay you interest. And the holding there should be as low as 20% uh, for older people, higher for younger people, as low as 10%. The stocks investments should be 20, 30 for most people in the ages, but you reduce 10% for older people. Real estate for older people, should be as high as possible, but there should be rent earning real estate, not growth type of real estate. Rent earning real estate are blocks of flats, like a block of flat in Madaraka, which is very rent intensive, a block of flats in um, that place near Riara University, rent intensive, a block of flats in Eastlands, areas of 
um, uh, uh, such as Embakasi, areas such as Imara Daima, some areas of Mombasa Road that are very rent intensive. Rent intensive is a house where a tenant walks out today and another one is lining to come up. Not one where you buy an asset and you wait for three months for someone to ask if they can rent it. So if you have rent intensive assets, Rongai uh, area kind of place where you someone is living in the morning and by evening the, the room is booked, you don't take too long to replace a tenant. Occupancy rate is high, investment is low, and rent, 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 or rent yields are high. Those are the kind of assets that people should hold when they are old. So my moderator, I give it back to you to ask people to ask me questions. I am not seeing many in the, in the question area. I'm only seeing three. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Oneo, for that excellent presentation. Uh, indeed, you've added a brick, if not bricks, into our financial house that we are all trying to build in a very uh, clear way. I will take, um, I, I will, uh, uh, take some questions and, and, of course, uh, direct them to you. Um, the, the first person is anonymous and asks about the property you referred to at the beginning, 850K, and he wants to talk to you. So I uh, will ask him to get in touch with you. But now the, the other question is, is about um, property. So uh, McLean Atieno asks, if I am buying a property for rent, how many years should I get my, in how many years should I get my money back? I think the, the crucial thing is to understand that a typical property in Nairobi will give you a cash rent yield of around 11, 12%. Except properties in the areas like, um, the dangerous areas like Dandora, where the investment is low and the return is higher. So if I'm talking about a normal property, the cash yield is 12% on a very higher side. So depending on the level of investment, the payback period might be slow, um, perhaps more than 12 years. But for property, the issue is not payback. The issue is how what is happening in that area. You may have property in an area that is going to be paying you rent every month with a very high occupancy rate. Occupancy means the number of tenants that are occupying it. You may have a good property in current, but the occupancy rate is very low. You may have a very good property in a block of flats in say Kilimani with 60% occupancy rate, yet you have a property in Bongai where people are lining up uh, to, to occupy it. The investment is lower in the property in Bongai. The finishes, the money you need in the finishes in a property in Bongai is lower compared to the money you need in the finishes in Kilimani. You may need 20,000 per square meter in, in Rongai, 46,000 in Kilimani, 380 per square meter in Karen. So the payback period has a lot of respect, with, uh, has a lot to do with the level of investment in that property. It is not given by the rate. It's the, the rate can be good, but the occupancy is poor. So those two numbers will have to be looked at before you are advised in this area, the payback period, 15 years. In this area, X years. In this area, X years. Now that requires you to sit with someone like me who know numbers. Otherwise, it is not one of those things, Yakuba it, Hatisha. It takes quite a bit of work to arrive at that. Uh, but I'll tell you for me, rent intensiveness is a key factor in rent yield than just the, the occupancy rate. Okay, thank you. The, yeah, you may have um, some very nice expensive property, but the number of people who can occupy it or who will line up for it are very few. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Next question is from Dr. Walter Mibay. Uh, he is referring to inflation and he asked that uh, there are reports that CBK tightly controls the exchange, elucidate the impact of uh, devaluation of the Kenya shillings against the USD, especially in terms of cost of living, impact of uh, on investments in real estate and impact on stocks. 
uh, still another person asked, what is the effect on, of inflation to uh, his investments? Those are two questions, regarding inflation. Inflation basically affects the purchasing power of the shilling. You and I are carrying the shilling. So when our inflation is, um, is, is getting out of hand, then we are paying more to acquire our goods and services. And the moment we are paying more to acquire our goods and services, we have less money available to invest. So the direct impact of inflation on investment is that you, it, it kind of takes more of your money towards consumption. That's the first one. Now, number two, there are companies whose fortunes are directly affected by the inflation rates. Uh, for example, <clears throat> if you look at um, a real estate, real estate business, and in real estate you've got the cement companies that produce cement. When, when people are not building because most of their money is going towards buying goods and services, then cement suffers directly. So unless the government is buying that cement to do roads, those companies don't have a drop in their market share. So inflation directly affects the purchasing power of the person so that they have less money to invest. If it is not that it affects the capacity of that business to generate extra income by loss in market share because their product is no longer desirable. So it depends on whether you are discussing inflation from the purchasing power of the person or inflation from the impact on the value of the asset which you're supposed to buy or sell. And both of them affect the fortunes of business. So if, 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 if when inflation is affecting your purchasing power, it is also affecting some assets, some specific assets that don't do well when inflation are rising. On the contrary, there are some companies that do work better when inflation is rising. There are very few, but there are specific sectors. <clears throat> so the, the real thing of inflation is the purchasing power, full stop, of the shilling. And that is the work of central bank to manage the purchasing power of the shilling. And I can tell you from the time Dr. Njeroge came in as the, as the governor of, of CBK, that is one thing that has been very well managed. Even in the face of a fiscal policy that is very heavy on spending money on infrastructure, the purchasing powers have been very well managed. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, follow up on the same is um, uh, from still uh, Dr. Walsa is advice uh, how to invest to uh, in order to counter any potential effects of the Kenya shilling devaluation. Like I, what I was saying is that. Um, if you are going to manage your portfolio alone, then you must become a guru. Because the, you need to know I'm holding assets that either are inflation negative, infl inflation positive, or inflation neutral. And I, I can swear, my brother, that's not a question I can answer uh, exhaustively in terms of the, the assets at the NSC, all of them. But I can give you an example. Unga feeds. Wunga and Wunga feeds. Wunga in particular, the guys who do Wunga, Wunga, Wunga Gano, the Wunga Gano and the Ugali, Wunga ya Ugali. That kind of company is inflation negative. We don't have pharmaceuticals in the NSC, but if GSK was in the NSC, GSK would be one of those companies that would be inflation negative. Because people, I mean, inflation neutral rather, because people consume food and medicine all the time. Breweries tends to be both inflation and neg ne uh, negative or neutral because people tend to drink just as much during bad time as they drink uh, more when things are better. Um, so brew uh, beer tends to be to do well in both in bad time but relatively better in a good time. Now cement only does well when the economy is growing. So cement will do well in an economic um, boom, not a recession. Now, companies that do well in a recession are largely insurance companies because they do well when people invest more in insurance when the risk is rising than when things are better. So now you can't get all that in one short meeting like this. So when you are preparing your investment plan, 
is when now you will now need to know what kind of assets do I need to get this plan um, a move off. Now you will be advised on the kind of assets and how they respond to inflation. So that as you select your portfolio, you select portfolios, assets that comprise a portfolio that move in different direction. So when inflation is going up, you have both assets that go down when inflation is going up and assets that go up when inflation goes up. So that when the movements in the opposite direction don't take you to zero. The growth in the ones that go up when the inflation is going up and the loss in, in the ones that go down when inflation go up is kind of square as to average. That is something you cannot know without being advised on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I, I urge you, my good doctors and engineers, to please make consultation necessary. You don't do this. You come when things are bad. Okay, uh, thank you for that. In fact, there's a question on your contracts. And just to confirm, uh, that you will share your, your contracts as well as the Excel sheets because I've seen a question on that. There's lots of interest in the, in the, in this topic. I'll try to combine some of the questions. So uh, one is about the portfolio, and one <coughs> like to several people like to get um, a summary on how to uh, balance portfolio based on age. In a really one minute, how do you balance portfolio by age? So someone is saying that at 35, another person is 60. Um, yes, in a summary. How do you conclude this? Age drives risk appetite and ability to take risk. Younger people have lower income and can carry assets that won't pay them cash, but promise growth. So they tend to buy, to afford what we call small stocks or small investments. Even if they are doing, even in real estate, they buy small assets. They'll buy a flat in Drongai, they'll buy a flat in Juja, they won't buy a flat in Sli, they won't buy a flat in the hot area of Nairobi because they can't afford it. But they buy one that they can afford and promise returns in future, what you call emerging areas. Yet the older person can afford a bigger asset, but so age basically drives the risk levels. Again, this is one of those things that you can't be advised without you sitting face to face with someone who look at your family circumstances. Age is not the only thing. It is also family circumstances. You can be 50 year old or 60 year old with no children, a lot of money. That age is irrelevant. But you can be 35 year old with six children. That brings in a completely different twist on the age aspect. So uh, is, is the, it, what I've said are generalizations, but you need a personalized ad, ad advice based on your age with a mix of family circumstances. In terms of whether or not the, the Excel, the Excel I shared yesterday with the lady called, um, what's her name again, Consolata, and she will share it with all of you. Uh, whether you know how to use it is the question that you can call me and I show you later. My contacts are public and Consolata has them, can give them. I will also share them here. That is not something to be discussing as available. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, and next question is about land. Someone wants to, uh, to know uh, whether, you know, your opinion on uh, buying land and which are the areas that you recommend. Uh, because one refers to, you mentioned the bypass. And if there are any land, but First of all, land is an item of investment in the portfolio for different reasons. For people looking for growth, you buy emerging areas. But don't buy emerging area. There are things we call drivers of value in land. And please write them down. I'll name them fairly fast. Number one is infrastructure. Or number one, call it government plan. Government plan. Let's start from government plan. Both national government and county government, depending on where you are buying this land. Today, if I am buying land in Kajiado, I would be very informed by the investment the government is making around the roads, around SGR. 
you don't have to go very far. Look at the budget and you see the budget allocating 2.7 billion shillings to connect the railway between um, Lenana School and Gong. That speaks something in future. The budget did allocate 2.7 billion shillings. Why was that? There are roads being done around Gong, three of them, to take off, to like, like lift off traffic from the SGR, even though the SGR has not picked. So that government plan dictates where infrastructure goes. So now I'll put infrastructure as number two. And infrastructure are roads, railway, water, power, uh, electricity. Those things determine what, how, how quickly your land become a cash producing land, as opposed to land which you bought somewhere and disappearing. And then number three is the quality of land given the use. So if you are buying land for farming, it's very different from if you are buying land for construction. You may find land which is rocky, but that land is very good for building houses. But if you want to build to do farming, then the land must be deep, the kind of land we get in Kiambu or those kind of areas. So the quality of land, the type of soils, and therefore the quality of land for its purpose, very key. Now for, for people who are in the next class, then they buy elevation, you know, just the beauty of waking up, seeing Gong Hills every morning or seeing Mount Kenya. It's therapeutic for someone, it costs you money. So those drivers of value must exist. So I don't belong to the school that says, run to, car, run to somewhere on, um, uh, go some 20, 30 kilometers on Mombasa Road or go some 20, 30 kilometers on Magadi Road and buy land. What is the government planning for that area and how is it going to change the area? I mean, look at what the government is doing in Kisumu. Unless you are blind, you can clearly see a port is coming up. You can clearly see there's an effort to take the railway to Kisumu. So if you are buying land in Kisumu, you are, it must be land that will benefit from the projects and the people that are coming in to use the port. The lorries that come to pick the goods, it must be land that will provide food to the people there or a place where you can recreate those people so you don't just buy land because land is being bought by buy land on the back of very useful intelligent uh, value adding information so i will not recommend any location unless you ask tell me your age and your preferences number two land buying companies is not the thing it is about the due process what you need to know is the due process it is you to follow the due process. Anyone can cut corners. It is you to ensure that you understand the due process and you follow it. And what is it? You don't buy land unless you've seen two searches. One on the title in terms of any encumbrances and two on the survey of Kenya as showing the movement of that land from various owners. We call it title root search. So once you have got those two searches, they confirm to you who was the original owner of, of that land. How has that land changed the hands up to now? And is there any encumbrance? That such, those two searches are absolutely necessary. Once you have that, then you move next to follow all the due processes. Transfers are signed between you and the, the seller in front of an attorney. And all every other step is followed. Signed by, you know, witnessed by an advocate capable of giving an oath. Most people get an, a, a sale agreement signed by a court clerk pretending to be a lawyer. Really, that is not being right uh, on, on the matters of the process. So follow the due process. Whether you buy that land yourself, you do it yourself or do it through somebody, follow the due process. Ensure that you understand the process before you start buying land. Otherwise, so the Okay, uh, thank you for that. For the next question, so if you could only answer within 30 seconds, so to summarize. And um, one is, is regarding bonds, government bonds, and uh, what is your take on these and the risk of default, and whether you think the heavy borrowing by the Kenya government uh, may pose risk of default. And then the second one is on insurance, comment insurance are, uh, as an investment, and also if um, it, it's an option you would consider. My friend, 
Did you hear Jesus tell some people that what is Caesar's give to Caesar? There is no way a government can default on its own bonds. It will print money and pay you back. The only problem is when they have printed money, will you still have value? So I don't, I don't consider the present level of borrowing by the government to be very risky because the lender called IMF and the lender called World Bank have a lending matrix and they will not lend to you unless you can pay back. The government still has room for paying back that money. Most of the monies the government is receiving today is monies being given to every country in the world to survive Corona. They may appear as loans, but they are really loans being given to all countries uh, to rejuvenate what you call economic stimuli loan. So if you told me the government is borrowing to do roads, then I understand that as a borrowing. And if that borrowing goes in excess of 60% of the GDP, then the government is beginning to cross the red line. But you see, as you pay the loans back, that GDP line keep moving back. So some of the loans that the government is receiving today, they are not very risky loans. They are loans being given by IMF to, to jumpstart the economy in everywhere because of Corona. They are not, they are not things I would be very worried about because they are the kind of loans that you may never need to pay back for 20 years. And so the risk of default by a government can be real, but I've only I've not seen one happen in the world over except in Greece, it nearly happened in Greece, but it never happened because of the, the way that the, the relationship between the government of a country and the World Bank is one where the World Bank is a lender of less plus resort to a government to keep it alive. Uh, in terms of insurance, uh, but, so let me go back to the bonds. The good rates that you are seeing on bonds are good. They don't last forever. Uh, the kind of bonds the government has taken lately uh, are very well priced, therefore the, the returns are very good. I mean, those are bonds you want to buy if you are liquid. Uh, they, are, they are bonds you want to buy. The, the Kenya government until today is quite solid. Number two, um, in matters of insurance, insurance is a contract of utmost good faith. When you take on insurance, please declare. At utmost good faith, declare everything. Number two, if it is insurance the type that you take on, child education, make sure that you have a very good way of estimating the future fees, because that's where we have a problem with insurance. You buy insurance today uh, to, to pay fees in 15 years. Strathmore University here is costing you 450K uh, um, uh, uh, an academic year. You are discussing at least 2.5 million, 2.3 million for, for four academic years today, in the next three years. If you buy a policy, will it pay for your school fees in 15 years? No. So sit down with an advisor so that there's a very good, you, are, you arrive at a very good estimate of the amount of money you need so that you can mix an, a policy and other investments to raise the end, in, the end game income which you need. Uh, for purposes of that purpose of paying school fees or whatever obligation it is. So insurance is largely a savings instrument, which doesn't pay you more than 5% compounded. So please don't expect too much from insurance. Buy it because you need liquidity, but you must combine insurance with other investments. And as much as possible, pay insurance as early as possible. If you are not married, Education insurance is not meant for those who are married. It's meant for those who desire to have children in the future. You can begin buying an education insurance in your name. A child is only a beneficiary. So you can actually buy and pay an insurance before you get married and finish it. By the time you are married, you're just waiting for it to mature. So let's remove those traditional thinking like, you know, I don't have babies. How can I buy insurance? Insurance is in your name. Babies are only beneficiaries. So insurance is not adequate to pay fees. Please always mix it with, with some investment that is long-term in nature and that promises high returns. I don't have a problem with time, but you seem to have a problem with it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, so much. And our time is up, but uh, we'll just ask two final questions. 
Uh, one is regarding uh, someone wants to know whether it is a good idea to uh, acquire a mortgage at this uh, at this time, and is uh, that five years old. And then the second question is if you could comment on other forms of investments other than what you've discussed already. And someone is uh, <coughs> in healthcare business, you no know, investing in healthcare, uh, buying uh, stocks that are foreign, offshore, uh, transport business, and cryptocurrency. I think we need to separate investments from business when you buy when you buy when you buy a business you would say you are investing but when you are starting a business you're not investing you are taking a risk you don't understand so you can buy a share in a business that's doing well medical or otherwise transport or otherwise but you must understand the dynamics of the business you're buying into so that you have a reasonable chance of making return from that business before you put money in it. Cryptocurrencies it has been touted as an investment. The truth is, it is not really an investment. It's a one-sided game that will pay you return for as long as it's a one-sided game. But you need to understand how cryptocurrencies work because that's where we lose money. We go in there expecting abnormal returns in a very short time and then the demand supply is not a normal factor like a market demand supply of cryptocurrencies is controlled like a tap by one person just the way central bank release, does release shillings to buy dollars that's the way cryptocurrencies work so if you don't understand cryptocurrencies i can never recommend it to you you don't do what things you don't know you will lose money before you even buy it uh, so there are a lot of other alternative investments. We call them D rates. It's a D, the, the rates, the real estate investment trusts are here in this country. D rates are development rates. Um, that, that mall in Karen, I'm forgetting the name, the one heading to, um, uh, towards uh, Kikuyu. I don't know that, that road heading towards Kikuyu is called what? That, that mall there was built by a D rate where you bring in your million, I bring in my million, someone brings in his watch, it is all combined and is used to develop that mall. Then the mall is sold, and then you are paid your million plus a return. That's a very good investment if you are in investing in such first class assets. But it is done by uh, institutions that require such large capital that they might not discuss 200K, they discuss a million minimum. So there are a lot of investment options but they are not for everyone. They depend on, they may ask for such amounts of money that you, you want, but you can't participate. I've heard talking about foreign currency. Foreign currency trading is, is like buying and selling tomatoes. Today you make, tomorrow you lose. You need expertise in understanding the drivers of the value of the currency. It takes long to master. I have been a dealing room myself for a, a, a full 18 months. I still cannot trade properly today because you, you, you just have to be on the screen all the time. And I like that patience. So that I can't talk about much. Now you asked some question about real estate or what? The uh, very first question. Mortgage, mortgage. Um, mortgage, I am the consultant for affordable mortgages. The time to buy a mortgage is when you are young and you take a mortgage to show up your capital base. So buy a small mortgage, pay it quickly. This is the best time to buy a mortgage because property are coming at very low prices. And then pick a mortgage that is easy to pay. There are more than 10 banks doing mortgages at 9% now. And there are more than 11 circles doing mortgages at around 9%. Those things are there already. So the question of the right time is about, is it the asset that is right or is it the interest that is right? Number three, is your age right? Buy a mortgage when you are young. When you buy a mortgage when you're young, what you're doing is all the capital gain is yours. Please, Buruburu will always be Buruburu. Don't expect Buruburu to give you 30 million tomorrow. You will not get that. But you can buy a small apartment on Juja Road. In nine years, it is three times. Sell that apartment, move to where you should go with it. There's time to, for capital gain. There's time for cash rent. And as you, as you rebalance the portfolio, May the Lord be with you. Thank you so much um, for really answering those questions. And well, I think uh, a little bit of seeing um, from the chat.
that option, people are asking if we could uh, extend a bit. So if there are people who are willing, I think we can take on more questions because I think they are pertinent. And I think our facilitator, Mr. Omeo, said he has time. So I think for the sake of those who really want some of these questions still pending in the Q&A, we can um, have that answered maybe for another 15 minutes. And we can do that. Okay. Excellent. So, um, yes, you can take a few more questions. Feel free to, to leave. If you'd like uh, to, to leave, we won't uh, keep you. Uh, but for those who can stay, we'll uh, take a few more questions. That would be uh, wonderful if you uh, <coughs> agree. So, then, uh, in, in that case, um, I will go to the next question about um, the, how to increase, um, to increase cash flow for investment. What are your thoughts on reducing tax obligation? Tax obligation is something you can't do much about because KRA has already given you a tax rate. So the only way you lower the tax rate is by taking advantage of the legal provisions given to you. One is take maximum. Currently the KRA, the Finance Act allows you to take up to 20,000 shillings as pension from your income. And that reduces what you call the taxable income. So that's the one way of reducing the absolute tax you pay. It may look small, but if you give it years, 10 years, 15 years, 800 to 5,000 of savings, a lot of money. Number two is take advantage of the mortgage. If you have a mortgage, you have an, a, an interest to live of 12,500 per month or 150 per annum. So right now, people are doing tax returns. In that form, there was a place where you were supposed to reduce your tax taxable, uh, the taxable amount by that mortgage relief if you have a mortgage. And if you have a mortgage, then KRA have your PIN number, so they are able to reconcile that from your P9 at their end. The third one is people who are holding um, life-based insurance policies. You are allowed to take a portion of your premiums. I don't know the line it is, I've not seen my tax terms were done by someone. I don't know what line it is now in the tax return, but you're allowed to take a portion of your insurance premium for life policies. All these things have been done to encourage people to participate in those parts of, of the economy. So that's the only way you can lower your taxes. Otherwise, the tax rates will go by the income levels. And the only way you avoid paying taxes is you do a business. When you do business, then you fast earn the money, remove all the expenses that are allowable, and then pay taxes on the remaining money. So sometimes uh, it is easy for us to now enjoy things like cars that we can now own in the name of the business, do the business with it, and the same car takes me home in the evening. So yeah, that is, if, if in business is quite different from personal income. So for a doctor who's practicing, please make sure you sit with an, a tax advisor, not an accountant, a tax advisor to show you how you are what provisions of tax your business is allowed to benefit from when you are starting so that you operate in a tax what you call a tax smart way uh, at, at the beginning of the business yeah so, so. Uh, thank you uh, next question is on stocks and um which are the two to three stocks um that you could recommend that could have been discounted due to Corona and are likely to rebound, uh, to, to, establish, uh, to have a rebound. And the other one is, uh, other than BAT, which other stocks have traditionally paid high dividends? You know, Jack, um, you don't make recommendations in a public. People will make mistakes. Stocks are bought by ages. Stocks come in three forms, what we call growth stocks, growing business and mature stocks and they are not suitable for everyone so number one all stocks are at a discount except safaricom that is riding on the benefit of technology all of them are at a discount the question is how much discount that's number one. After all the bank stocks are at a discount they are lower than they were just look at the price of those stocks before corona and the price of those stocks today and though that information is online so go online, ask for the NSC list as at the day before we discovered Corona in Nairobi, I think 13th March, 
2020 and then check 13th March this year. What are the prices of that stock? That you'll, you'll, you'll tell. So you don't make a recommendation in a public say this is good, this is bad. Because then people who don't qualify to buy, to buy that share will buy it and then claim on their I have, um, I am, I am part of the CFA Institute Ethics uh, Court, and I don't, I don't breach the court. So I will not recommend any stock to in a public. But you can call me, give me your circumstances, and I will tell you what stocks you qualify for. Of course, with a small fee, which you fear paying, but if you need it, then there it is. That's okay. We will provide <coughs> your contact details. And there's actually someone asking. Uh, you could recommend any portfolio manager. So mm. again, you said probably you wouldn't recommend. Yeah, portfolio software. managers are there. Those ones are public information. Um, portfolio managers, unfortunately, are members of the Chartered uh, CFA Institute. You have very few of them. There's Ross, there's Blasky in um, Yaya's, not Yaya, um, Sarif Center. She's doing it on a full-time basis. There is a friend called Od Od um, CFA Odolo. He's somewhere in Yaya, near Yaya Center, in an apartment. I don't know whether Corona still keeps him there or he's moved. But if 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 he just just go and Google CFA, just Google CFA CFAs who are port, who are who are portfolio managers. Uh, there are those who are employed, but there are those who are on their own. They must be charter holders. Uh, anybody else cannot pretend to be offering portfolio management advice. There'll be a problem there. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Another question is about agriculture. What do you think of farming as an investment? Farming is not an investment until you are buying in a farm. Farming is, an, is just like business. You take risk on the agri side first of it. If you are growing crops, you grow crops first. If you are keeping animals, you keep animals first. Then you now sell the produce. Now, when you begin selling the produce, the business element comes in, the market dynamics, the price. So for you to be in the farming, then there's a learning curve that you must go in. So you go small, Ujifunze Kwanza, Uelewe farming, Alaf Uelewe market, then now you can expand. It's very easy for people to be told, put money on, watermelons in 90 days you have it you will have watermelons in 90 days but now who will buy it if watermelon comes to the market like now in july when it is cold who is eating it we eat melons in the dry months so those are the dynamics that someone need to learn and unfortunately it is not a buy and move if you want buy and move then go to the nsc and buy farm farm based stocks but if you want to do farming as for farming, then first learn, just like a medical field, learn the intricacies of farming. Then once the farming is done, the produce is out, learn the business elements of market. And if you can get your own market, I have a friend who has been exporting avocados to Netherlands for seven years. He's only made profit in two years of the seven. And he's been there. He's an, a BSc agri holder who has spent 24 years in that space. So it is not, it is not um, a light issue, jump in and make success. No, but it can be done with a little bit of patience. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, another person would like to uh, look at costs or rather mm. the, the expenses related to investments and they, would like, uh, and they would like you to comment on the acceptable le uh, level of cost. For instance, if it's a, it's, a, it's a flat, then there's the maintenance fee of the flat and land the same. So what is the acceptable, acceptable level of cost uh, that, that allows you to uh, still earn a decent income from this uh, kind of assets? For stocks, that one is given is about 0 0.19. Anytime you buy and sell, you pay that. The NSC has factored that in the price. For property, we call them closing costs. They are about 9% of the market value of that property. Closing costs will always be 9%, especially if you are borrowing. They are less if you're not borrowing. Because if you aren't borrowing, you pay stamp duty at 4% in Nairobi and 2% upcountry. And you must also pay the lawyer's fee, which is usually a legal scale. So unless you negotiate that, it is not going to go very far. 
So the real one that you really drop out is the, the negotiation fee of the financial institution if you are not borrowing money. So the closing costs are bound by legal legislations, lawyers by their, by their scale, valuers by their scale. Just the way you can't negotiate them in a block manner, you can only negotiate one by one. But it's no more than 8%, 9% of the value of the asset. That cost is not too much if it is spread over the break-even period. Um, all the other assets have some legal cost. Where there is some contract, there is always a lawyer in, in, in the space, and the lawyer will always charge you their fee. Uh, ideally, the fee should be there should a flat a flat minimum fee, and then a scale as the values go up. Then there's a maximum that uh, they should not charge beyond. So negotiate the fees. That's the only thing I can tell you. Go lawyer, go with the lawyer and isolate his costs and negotiate them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, the other question is on investment groups and what are your thoughts on how the how doctors can use this approach of an investment group and the <coughs> one um, second one is about bonds whether it's advisable to buy from the secondary market when you've missed the primary market or do you wait for the next time you have a, a secondary uh, a primary offering uh, for investment groups the, the the what makes groups succeed is the quality of leadership in the group and the diversity of the skills in that group. When you say doctors, you, you make me freak because what I know about doctors and investment is like engineers. Uh, they come to fail together as opposed to come to grow together. When I say come to fail together, it's not that because they intended to fail together, but because of the nature of your practice, most of you are too busy. You are not able to participate in entrepreneurial risk taking that become a key element of success in group investing and, and ability to measure and just understand risk. So you find a few doctors uh, like my friend in, um, in, uh, in Buruburu who has invested very actively in the NSC and succeeded, but because he participates. So that lack of participation by doctors is a key element. So I would, I, would, I would recommend that you go into a group where there are business people and where there are people, generally people who take risks, not just doctors only. And if they are doctors, then there must be doctors who take risks in the other area of entrepreneurship and general investment. So that because you are dealing with investment returns and investment risks that we need to understand. Two, consult. Consult widely at the beginning so that you set up the right infrastructure, uh, right objectives, and then you get the team around you, the investment team that can support you. The skills which you don't have in the group, you can hire them, but you need to know that upfront when you are setting up the, the group so that you are told you require a valuer, you require this guy, you require this guy, given your objectives. Then you identify those guys earlier and then put them to do what you cannot do. That should not be a reason for you to stop investing as a group. In terms of buying bonds in the primary or secondary market, that is irrelevant. When you are buying, the only problem with buying a bond in secondary market is getting the size. Uh, the, the bonds are sold in very large sizes in the secondary market. So you may wait long to get one. But in terms of price, once the bond is in the market, it will always have a price. So once you buy it, you sell it at the right time. The issue is not when you bought it, the issue is when you are now offloading it. Are you offloading it when the price is good or when the price is bad? Uh, thank you. Then on to the final questions now. Uh, one is about access to information and one, uh, one would like to know how one can access, uh, get to know, learn about government plans, e.g. Uh, areas to buy land based on uh, probably government projects that are coming up. So that's uh, one. And then uh, finally, someone would like to know how they can get a mentor, uh, a mentor, an investment mentor. I have the information bit on one slide. There are many. So to answer that, I will need to open a slide and just show you. But to summarize that, the, must, the government master plan is Vision 2030. If you have not read a copy of that document by now, um, please go to Cusco Center 
I'm not sure if they are still there. They used to be in Cusco Center. Uh, Division 2030 Secretariat. Find a copy from them. I always carry mine in my bag. Number two, you can let, you can download abridged copies and the detailed copies online. The Vision 2030 plan is online. From the Vision 2030, all the other plans are developed. Now at the county, there's something called County Integrated Development Plan, otherwise called CIDP. It is also online for most counties. And where it is not, there's a liaison office that can offer you a PDF copy of that. So 47 counties online or otherwise, our liaison offices will give you that. Then at municipalities, there's what you call uh, integrated uh, a town or there's another another level of an, an integrated development plan. So that, that, that those plans keep going like that. The CIDP at the county, each municipality has a plan. So you need to pick those plans and they are available publicly and read them. So you can't read them for the entire country unless you are me who has interest in the entire country. You need to read them for the areas of interest. If you are interested in Machakos County, pick Machakos County, pick Machakos Town or Mwala Town, whatever it is, the, 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 the municipality plan and read it. Each municipality has a plan. There is also the law called Urban Centers and Cities Act, a very key law that tells you a few things about what urban centers are and the kind of infrastructure they should have. Those, if you read the count, the CIDP and the five-year plan for the county, that's all you need to know what the county is intending to do in terms of infrastructure, hospitals, roads, nini, agriculture, and where the government takes money, infrastructure comes. Okay. And please don't ignore the manifesto of the government of the day. The manifesto of the government of the day drives budgets that you will see for five years. So even if you hate that government, you can't hate where they take the budget. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, probably uh, maybe one that came last, but I guess it's something that everyone is thinking about is about the election next year as a risk to investment so should one think of buying stocks now or, or wait until after the election and then finally uh, uh, property uh, property for rent versus bonds what could you recommend then i will ask um, uh, members of the circle to respond on the kmrc uh, mortgage did you say property for rent yes yes versus bonds bonds give you uh, what looks like a very good rate of return a bond can perhaps pay you um, a much better rate in the short run, but a bond has a place in your portfolio. A bond is held up to say 20% of your portfolio for liquidity. Property is in your portfolio as a source of long-term uh, income. So it will be in the 60% of your property or 40% depending on your age. So these things play different parts in a portfolio. So you can't compare them. Um, a property gives you what a bond can't give you. A bond will give you a good return for X years, then the bond disappears. The property will give you good returns for the longest time in, 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 in your life. So depending on how much life you have, a property is a long-term investment that gives you both capital growth and also give you rental income. A bond will give you very little capital growth but good rental income for a fixed period of the life of the bond, and that's it. So they play different roles in your portfolio. And I don't think it's fair to compare them unless you are only making one investment in between the two. The, the next question was about what? Election risk uh, and the stocks. Election is always a risk to the business and a stock represents a share in a business. So if election is going to fundamentally affect the fortunes of a business negatively, then the shares of that business will be down during that period. Does that mean that the shares won't come back after election? No. So look at the prospects of election destroying a business completely, then it becomes a major risk. But if election will not destroy the business you're buying completely, then it's only a temporary movement in the price. 
the temporary movement in the price is not something we look at investing. Because for example, I, people are still holding Kenya Airways today. As much as you know, Kenya Airways has been half dead for quite a while. Does it, make Kenya, does it mean that Kenya Airways will never come back? That's not true. That Kenya Airways may, may come back when you are no longer there. So you are buying, if you're holding Kenya Airways, you are perhaps holding it for your children or mumias. You're not holding it for you if you are 50 like me. So for a, for a person of my age, I won't be holding Kenya Airways. I'll be holding companies that are more liquid because my age demands that now I receive cash, not current illiquidity and growth and drive for growth. But for a doctor who has just left campus today, 25 years old, the cheapest share they can buy is one bob, two bob, three bob, ten bob. They'll be struggling to spend 50,000 bob to buy 500 shares of, of BAT. So they'll buy those shares that reflect their risk factor. But I will still not tell them to buy Kenya Airways because the prospects of Kenya Airways depend on the global platform, which has to be managed differently. One, by combining assets of the company and those of KAA, so that it begins to operate in a world-class manner. For as long as KAA is offering service at the airport, that third grade service, you wouldn't have a good airport here. And so Kenya Airways will be paying expensively for very low service. Uh, bags will keep disappearing, remaining and what I will. And that will not improve the fortunes of that company. Yeah, thanks. Oh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ameo, indeed. For let me answer the question on KMRC. The question of KMRC has got nothing to do with um, uh, K KMA, for example. KMRC is a Kenya mortgage finance company formed by member institutions which are 11 circles and nine banks. There were 10, but CBA and NIC combined together, they are now one. Now the place of KMRC is to offer a refinance money to primary mortgage lenders that have already issued mortgages so that they can issue a new, a new amount, a new, a new round of mortgages. Now this, the, 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 the intention of KMRC is to make, make mortgages available to people who have not been able to afford mortgages. So that there's a, there are two funds, one fund by the World Bank that targets people with income below 150 and another fund by the African Development Bank that targets people with more than 150 million, 150,000 income. So KMRC remortgage finance does not only target people who have less than 150. It targets first time buyers. That's the first condition. You must be a first time buyer. If you have less than 150,000 income per month or less, there's a fund that gives you a, that targets 80% of its money for those kind of people. Those who have got income above 150, but are first time buyers, there's a fund that has been given by African Development Bank that target those kind of people that want to buy a property more than uh, that, that that require a salary more than more than uh, 150, and they receive that fund targets 60 percent of the borrowers to have that kind of income and 40 percent of the borrowers to have income less than 150. So it is not true that um, affordable mortgage is only for 150 and below. That is not entirely true. And it's a fact that I'm the only one who can confirm. Otherwise, KMRC itself. Okay. Uh, again, uh, many thanks and for indulging us through this question. <clears throat> Beyond uh, the hour, and also to thank all participants. I still see we have over almost 250 people still uh, online. So thank you so much. Uh, I will hand over the meeting now to the chairman of KMA Sako to uh, give a word and close the meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Jack, um, for, uh, for the excellent moderation. And of course, uh, big appreciation to Mr. Wameo for such a, an excellent uh, presentation. I think we've really learned a lot, uh, as you may well be aware. Um, doctors are quite ignorant when it comes to, to investments. And this really is an eye opener for, for all of us. And you can see from the participants, we still had a lot of participants even up to the 
period where we'd, we'd extended the time. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wameo, for, for such an excellent uh, insight into the investment uh, issues. Thank you, participants, for, um, for staying on, uh, uh, for staying on almost two hours. It means really that you are very interested in, uh, in this topic. So I, I thank you very much. Uh, thank you, the Education Committee, for setting up uh, this, uh, this webinar. It's, uh, we, we, we truly appreciate the, the efforts that you've put in and also the efforts that you've put in in identifying the, the 